Before we dive in, I have a quick favor to ask of you. If you haven't already, consider leaving a review on Apple Podcasts. More reviews, whether that's a five-star review or a written review, help us show up higher in the search results so more and more people can listen to the Farm Traveler podcast the more reviews we have. If you've already done that, or maybe you don't listen on Apple Podcasts, which is totally fine, consider sharing an episode with a friend or family member that you think might enjoy a certain episode. We now have a backlog of almost 100 episodes of great conversations with farmers, ranchers, entrepreneurs, and a whole bunch of other people in the food and agriculture space, so consider sharing one of those episodes. And as always, if you want to see more of our content, go to thefarmtraveler.com. Hello and welcome to episode 98 of the Farm Traveler podcast. I am your host, Trevor Williams, and today we are talking with the CEO and co-founder of a company called Telesense. His name is Naeem Zafar, and Telesense is a cool new technology that Naeem and um, the whole company there have developed that help grain farmers. They use machine learning and a whole bunch of data to figure out the best way to store grains in grain bins, grain elevators, stuff like that. So they're on a whole mission to take the guesswork out of crop monitoring, storage, and transportation to help reduce waste and to help fight climate change. So this is such a cool interview with Naeem. And also, we're going to talk about this in depth in the interview today. Naeem started not one, not two, but seven companies in Silicon Valley which is super duper impressive. One of those companies, actually, they sold to Oracle a few years ago. It was actually the company that developed the fingerprint scanner on an iPhone, which is super cool. So he's going to talk to us about that, his whole background, how he's actually um, an engineer by trade, and how we got into developing companies in Silicon Valley. I mean, Farm Traveler is now officially an LLC, and I can't imagine doing it seven times. And I know making a legit company is a little bit harder than making an LLC. So, I mean, all credit and all respect to Name for all the hard work he's done. Uh, but this is such a cool interview. We're going to talk about the process of starting a company. When do you know is the right time to sell it or to keep building it? Um, what his thoughts are on technology and AI? What exactly artificial intelligence is and how it can kind of help with sustainability And yeah, this is such a fun interview. We kind of geek out talking about technology and even 3D printed food at one point. So it was super cool. Super, super excited to have Naeem on the show. And also super excited that we are so close to episode 100. I mean, this is episode 98. We are two episodes, two weeks away from being our 100th Farm Traveler podcast, which is so exciting. Thank you all so much for listening. Um, I'm going to do a question answer episode, possibly for episode 100. So if you want to send me a question, go in the description of this podcast and you'll see a little link that says solo slash farm traveler. And if you click that, you'll also see on a new page how to email us. So email me there. Or if you follow us on Instagram or Facebook, um, send me a message, send me a DM with any sort of farm traveler question or even podcasting question, ag, farming, whatever, and I'll answer it. I think it's so cool. We're getting to episode 100, um, and it's all because of you, our absolutely wonderful and amazing listeners of this podcast. So anyway, I'm going to stop jarring. Um, It is now time for episode 98 with Naeem Zafar from Telesense. I really hope you'll enjoy this episode, and thank you so much for listening. Well, Naeem Zafar, welcome to the Farm Traveler Podcast. How are you doing? Good, excellent. How are you? I'm good. I'm I'm super excited to chat with you. We'll chat um, about your new company, Telesense, and a little bit about how you're kind of working with the grain industry and stuff like that. But before we dive in, kind of tell us a little bit about yourself and your background. Well, I'm an electrical engineer. Uh, got my degree from Brown University in East Coast and did my graduate studies in the University of Minnesota. Got a little taste for agricultural land living in Midwest. I've been in California for the last uh, 25 years and uh, been involved with startup companies. And this is my seventh company. Last one was we sold to Oracle in mobile security. 
If you have an iPhone with a Touch ID, fingerprint sensor, we invented that. Apple ended up buying that company with two hands in between. And some other companies were in chip design space. One of them went public. So yeah, a lot of fun stuff. That's pretty cool. I mean, I've got an iPhone 8 Plus right now, so it's got that finger that finger scanner. So that's cool. You guys invented that. Um, so you've done seven companies in Silicon Valley. I mean, some people can barely start one. So, I mean, what what was that experience like? I mean, starting one company and then you wound up starting seven and then selling one to Oracle, which is pretty impressive. So what was that whole experience like? So experience is short answer is painful. <laughs> but mm. the long answer, <laughs> I, bet. I, I didn't start all seven. I either a, a couple I started, a couple I joined, a couple pulled me in. But I've been living in that ecosystem for you know 25 plus 30 years. But the answer is it's a uh, you know there are few things when you do when you can see the results of your errors or accomplishment in front of you. You work for a large company. Most of the time, you don't know what you did mattered or where did mm. it go. So that's why people love to cook because you can serve the dish and you can see the smiles in everybody's faces and you know did a good job. So to me, that is very appealing. And the second aspect is how many times you get to pick the problem you want to solve, you get to pick the people you want to work with, and you make the rules how to, what kind of culture you want. So the startup gives you that opportunity, which makes it very interesting. So every day is different. Every day is unique. And I almost sometimes can't wait to go to sleep so I can wake up and a new day awaits me. <laughs> That's awesome. It's, it sounds like it's one of those things where it's like never work a day in your life if you are yeah. really enjoying what you're doing. Exactly. Right. That's exactly. Right. Every day I look forward to it. Like, and this annoys my family because like, what's wrong with you? It's like, yeah, tomorrow. Excellent. <laughs> yeah. Most people don't look forward to Monday mornings, but it sounds like you do. I do. I do. So what makes Silicon Valley so conducive to all these startups and all these kind of tech um, companies that are that have been starting kind of the past 10, 15 years? I mean, what makes that place kind of the perfect area? So this is an interesting question, and I have a full two-hour presentation on this, but let me summarize in two minutes. Sh short answer, culture. Hmm. So culture is, if you're strange, you're beautiful. If you're different and thinks differently, you you are admired in many other cultures you are basically you know it's a whack-a-mole they'll, they'll whack you if you're looking different or do things differently silicon valley that's celebrated and if you fail that's a badge of honor mm. that's not a negative even when you see a soldier with many of those medals on his that's not for winning the battle they're for being in the battle so this idea that you can try things work with interesting people from all over the world and you fail most of the time, but sometimes you work and there's no stigma attached to that and you get paid well, like why not? So <laughs> it's a very interesting culture culture here. That, yeah, that sounds interesting. I mean, most everywhere else, if you if your company fails, it's kind of like, that's it, nobody else cares. But I mean, it sounds like in Silicon Valley, I mean, there's so many tech startups where they're trying to answer a problem or disrupt an industry. So if you fail, they see that you're trying something. And nine times out of 10, it seems like when somebody fails a company, they just start a new one that seems to usually do better than the first one. Exactly. Because I think the adage is, the, the, the way we look at it, somebody else paid the tuition for your learning, so I don't have to. Because a mm -hmm. smart person is not going to make the same mistake twice or thrice. So if you made already made this mistake, now you're more valuable to me than if you are never had a mistake or never failed. So failure is kind of a nice thing in a in an odd way. It prepares you for the next job in a in, in a way that you successful people are not prepared. I like that. that whenever it, it comes with like failures and um careers, I always think about that kind of the picture you'll see where it's like a perfectly straight line. And under under it is is something written like this is what success looks like to some people <laughs> what they think it is, yeah. and then they're like this is what success really is, and it's like a super duper like crooked curly yeah. line where it's like success takes all different paths and it's not just like a straight and narrow option. You're absolutely right, but let me throw one more wrinkle on this. Define, uh -oh. define success. Oh, that's true. I mean, success is going to differ from everybody, right? Exactly. So if you ask my wife, only two of these companies have been successful. If you ask mm. me, all of them were successful mm -hmm. because the definition I'm using is, do I know more smart people at the end of the adventure than I knew at the start of the adventure? Mm. So my definition, because, you know, at some point when you have your basic needs met, what is success? I mean, 
suppose I had extra million dollars. Will I buy newer, different clothes? No, I'm very comfortable in the clothes I got. Will I eat more? Well, I hope not. Will I, what will I, what will I do differently? You know, so your perspective begin to change. So success needs to be defined. So do you think success and contentment are kind of the same thing or can they be the same thing they going can off be. of that? They can be. I mean, to me, it's about a pur- purposeful life. Are you living with a purpose? Are you making, contributing more than you took in? If that's the metric you use, and that's why I'm also a, you know, a professor at uh, UC Berkeley, University of California, Berkeley and Northeastern, because I'm also packaging the things I've learned and giving it to the next generation so they can take it further. To me, that's very satisfying and that's success. Yeah. So what's that experience like um, being a professor? So I taught for two years. I was telling you earlier. And I mean, that was super fun. I taught high school ag um, and that was super fun, but I can only handle it for like two years. And so what's it like being a college professor? I mean, you've got so many people that are getting ready to go into the workforce. They've got ideas they want to try. So what's that whole thing like? Well, it's, it's a beautiful thing uh, because, as you well may know, or you'll find out soon, you know your kids don't always listen to you, but students do, and mm-hmm. you can see their minds shifting, the furniture in their mind being rearranged during the course of the semester, and you, then you keep in touch with them, and many of them go on to start companies, do wonderful things. They often come back with you, to you for more advice, and nothing. What could be more satisfying? So it, it really is beautiful, and. It's also a cheap talent pool. So out of my company, nine of the people were my ex-students who have chosen to come work for me. So, you know, there's there's a nice camaraderie here, which you can't buy. Money cannot buy this. That's a good point. I mean, and it seems like if they're in your class and then they go to work for you, you can build upon kind of an already established relationship, which I mean, you know what working with each other is like, or you know what it's like teaching them. And then you bring them into your company and you already know that relationship is like, and you know, kind of their skill set and stuff. Exactly. That's exactly right. So, all right, you've made, or you've, you've kind of started or you've worked with starting companies and then some have been sold, like you were saying earlier with Oracle. Um, at what point um, do you know now is the right time to sell your company or we need to keep going to reach a certain point? So at what point do you kind of take one of those roads? Well, there are three buckets. One bucket is when you are running out of money. That's (laughs) That's a good point. Yeah. And that happens more often than you think. Uh, You know, unable to raise money and then, you know, best thing is just to sell and just get out of it. Because it's like get out of jail card. So when you get out of jail, then you're free. You can do new things. But in jail, (laughs) you can't do too much. Uh, The second thing is when you realize that, you know, the you have built a, either a culture or your investors and it, it's not fun anymore because the chemistry has gone sour. The people mm-hmm. you hired, the people they hired, other dynamics have changed. Life is too short to keep putting up with misery. You know, you know, So it's time to sometimes get out and start fresh. And I've done that a couple of times. The third bucket is when you realize that you've reached a point, you, you can take it this far. To go to the next stage will require a heavy investment. And then the company, like the company with Oracle, the one who bought, we were mobile security. We figured out a way how you can log in from your iPhones and iPads into corporate servers, SharePoint, access those things, authentication. And we got big clients like Exxon Mobil and Chevron. But how do you reach the next 1,000 people? Mm. Oracle has the channel. People trust them to buy from them. So this would have allowed the technology to scale. We would have to raise hundreds of millions of dollars to build the channel. So that was a third bucket. When you realize, to realize your potential, that's the best way forward. That's a good point. I mean, it, it sounds like with Oracle, you kind of shared the same vision, but they had the the resources and the manpower to kind of continue what you guys were doing. Yeah, exactly. So, you know, sometimes this that's the right thing to do because you have to think about what's right. What was your vision? Why did you start the company? If you, you Nobody starts a company just to get a job. You have a vision and that vision is your magnet. That's how you attract talent. And that's the best way to realize the vision is to, you know, sell it to some bigger company. So, so going off of that vision, I mean, do you think whenever you're starting off of that vision, is it because you see a need that needs to be met or do you want to disrupt an industry or, or is that kind of the same thing? It's sometimes, the same, not always, sometimes the same thing. 
sometimes it's industry disruption, but sometimes it's just an unmet need. You, every business start with identifying an unmet need, that of every good business at least. So the unmet need we saw in Telesense, are, are we ready to switch to that conversation or not yet? No, yeah, that's fine. Yeah, we, we can start talking about that. That's perfect. Yeah, so it, it was that, that, you know, there are probably more people relying on farming for the survival in the world than anybody else. I mean, of course, everybody has to eat, but people who are in the business, and it's a worldwide problem. And that's a tough business. These people eke by with very small profits. Question is why? And answer is they don't have the data to able to decide when to sell the crop. How long will it be good for? Can I hang on to it for extra one month when the pricing will be better? Do I have any spoilage? Is Are there pests? Will it blow up? So they don't know. So they take the, whenever they can find an opportunity, they sell it. And the fact is, if you had the data, you will make many, many smarter decisions about when to sell, when to blend, when to fumigate, when to move. All those decisions are made kind of part data, part intuition. And can we give them data in a way that they'll make smarter decisions? That impacts people worldwide. It's a double bottom line benefit. It's not only makes money, but it also improves people's lives and reduces carbon footprint by not having to over dry and use energy. So this realization, then question was, okay, that makes sense, but how come we can't be the first one of thinking of this? I mean, why hasn't it been done? And then we had to answer that question that, well, a bunch of things changed recently, which were not possible until now. Cloud computing, wireless uh, transmission became cheap enough. Internet of things, IoT, when you can transmit data for pennies per month and not like $30 a month data plan. And then wireless sensor became cheap enough that you can integrate. And the AI and machine learning software has become possible. Now maybe you can cook the right soup here because all the ingredients are available finally. And then we looked around and said, hey, if that's the case, has anybody else realized that yet? And we found out no. So that was our trigger point. Hmm. So are just right. Right. So how exactly does Telesense work? I mean, I've read up on it, and basically it's for grain harvesters, and you can use um, sensors and data to kind of track how the grain is doing in, in grain bins and stuff like that. So how exactly does your whole Telesense operation work? So being... Com company is to get data on the condition of the grain and make sense of it to make intelligent recommendation on what to do. All right. So give me an ex uh, So let me just even one step before. In the agriculture, I put everything into three buckets. One problem is what to plant, where to plant. So a whole bunch of companies are doing drones and soil analysis and figuring out what to do. We don't do that. Second bucket is, okay, once I've planted, how do I maximize my yield, reduce the you know, disease and everything else, genetics? A bunch of companies are doing that. We don't do that. The third bucket is post-harvest grain management. Once you harvest your crop, they never improve in quality. Corn, soybeans, sorghum, canola, they all go downhill. Question is, how long are they good for? When they go from grade two to grade three, uh, what kind of diseases are cooking there? That's the problem we are solving. So we highly focus on the third bucket. So the question is, making those decisions, how do you make the decision? How does the software need data? Well, what data do you need? Well, we need temperature, moisture, maybe carbon dioxide, because if there's a pest, they will generate CO2. All right. So where is the data sitting? Well, short answer, it's very expensive to get the data. It's manual. People have to go sniff insert some probes, check it out, that ain't gonna scale. So we came up with an interesting way to collect the data. Simple balls and spears with multiple sensors in the shaft of a spear, you can insert into the grain and all the electronics is built in, it starts sending data continuously and regularly. So once you're getting data by it's very simple, almost idiot proof, use case, just stick the sphere into the grain, walk away. That's your installation instructions. If you already have some kind of sensor, we can interface with them and collect the data into the cloud. Whether you're transporting in a barge, you're sending in a rail car, you have stored in a silo, or it's a ground pile. So we have a form factor for each one of those use cases. 
The trick is get the data easily, conveniently, inexpensively, wirelessly. So no, you don't have to send a guy out there. Then we can generate it. So imagine you are a, uh, you're working on a co-op or handling grain. You don't want to look at a bunch of numbers and, you know, what the heck does that mean? What you want is a text message which says, turn on the fans on bin number seven at midnight for eight hours. I can deal with that. That's very prescriptive. Why? Because Telesense has analyzed the grain moisture, the weather forecast, outside air temperature, your fan sizing, and you turn on the fan at midnight for eight hours, it's going to get your moisture exactly where you want it. So we do all the analysis. You just take action. So this oh, is wow. what, that's what okay. we do. So, so you're not only monitoring. I mean, you're also taking in all that data and telling the farmer, I mean, some tips and tricks on how they can make sure that grain stay, stays as good for as long as possible. That's super neat. Exactly. Because, you know, other few people who have been around for 30, 40 years, they just tell you what's there. You know, okay, it's good to know a temperature, but, you know, it, 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 you can buy a $5 thermometer, tell you the temperature. That's <laughs> good, but that does, you need a physician. We'll say, that's the, if this is the temperature and that's the condition and that's the color of the baby, do this. That's, we are the physician. That's a good point. So what all went into that research while you were developing how to not only harness the data, but also how to interpret that to where you can give farmers instructions on what to do to keep the gas levels, whatever they might need to be in the temperature perfectly. So what all went into that data or what all went into that research? So we end up setting up a whole data science team and we engage with several uh, people, agronomists, and put an advisory board together, professors and professionals who are expert in grain storage and people who are in grain trading business. So we put together a team of about a dozen people with different expertise. We've been at it for the last three years, building models, testing it, improving it. And there'll be some interesting announcement coming up in the next 12 months, but we already are serving, I think seven or 10, uh, seven out of the top 10 grain majors, their customers. And they are pretty excited about what we are able to do and what we're going to do. So I think we hit it at the right time, at the right place with the right approach. I'm, I'm getting pretty excited. Uh, it sounds like it. That's super cool. And uh, I'm imagining you said it's pretty simple. You just take the spear and you put it in the crops or in, in the bin. And so I'm imagining, is there an instruction on there where you can just take it and throw it in there kind of like a spear? Is there like a little diagram that shows you can do that? <laughs> or does it say kind of put it in there a little bit more gentle? No, no, no. Uh, so you have to stick it in there. So uh, silo spear is not a good. We have something else we call the spider. Mm. Uh, so I'll talk about that in a second, uh, because that was inspired by Bob Dylan. So there's a story there. Uh, but uh, the, the spears are good for ground piles and bunkers and barges and anything which is moving, because one version of that has a cellular connectivity. So you get a self signal. You just transmit the data. So that's for bins. We do have a different approach because you bun, you stuck a spear. Uh, by the time you drain the bin, it can get stuck in an auger or someplace. You don't want to mm -hmm. do that. So there, what we do is, you know, most bins have aeration fans. When fan is turned on, the air is going to move through the green mass. So remember that old song: "Listen to the wind. Wind knows." Mm -hmm. So instead of putting a bunch of cables and sensors, if you sense the, it went at, at, you know, making this up, 60 degree Fahrenheit and at 8% moisture, and it came out on the top at a different temperature and moisture, you can tell a lot what's going on. But listening to the air moving through the grain mass, you can pick up signals, temperature variation, moisture variation, CO2 variation. That's how we tell what is the health of your grain. You know, if you, if you take a baby and baby burps, you can you, you can tell what a baby is okay or not. <laughs> you know, the burp, burp, no, burp carries the information. Think of that that way. That's the approach we are taking for, for, for the bins. Okay, that's super neat. And that, that's the spider you were talking about? Yeah, yeah, spider. So one goes in the bottom, one goes in the, one in the plenum, one in the headspace. And by comparing the result from the two, at a certain frequency and some analysis, we can tell a lot. Okay, that's super neat. So, I mean, it seems like technology, especially AI, have been kind of helping farmers 
solve problems that they've had for years. And so how do you see that technology and even artificial intelligence kind of continuing that trend of solving problems quickly that have been around for centuries? So I think the idea is uh, all the decision farmer has to make could be aided by technology. Mm-hmm. How does it, you know, normally you, you you probably knew a grandfather, he can listen to your car and can tell you what's wrong with the car, is the transmission, or it's whatever it is. He knows because he heard, you know, 10,000 transmission noises. So most of the farmers have been in that category. They kind of know, they have a gut feel for it. Point is transferring the knowledge to the next generation is not easy. So in some way, we are capturing that knowledge, codifying it, digitizing it, and creating those algorithms and with machine learned behavior, able to make it easy for the next generation farmers to rely on that data. I mean, if you think mm-hmm. about that, that's a grand mission. For this is for our, own, our sustainability. Remember, world population is going up 26% in the next 30 years. And you know, arable land is not going up 26%, it's going down. So mm-hmm. we have to take some smart decisions to make sure we can feed the world and, and, and still take advantage of what we produce. So this is the mission. A lot of the grain is, in US, it's maybe half a percent to 2% is spoiled. But in other countries, the numbers are as high as 22% in Africa, 14% in Brazil, 30 some percent in India. So if you can make some smart decision and reduce that number, that's a big, big difference, big difference. And I'm sure that's a huge carbon footprint too. I mean, just of all that CO2 that's being released and I mean, what they have to do with the grains that have been, um, that have gone bad and that have spoiled. True, but it's worse than that. Because Mm. when you harvest corn, you're harvesting around 28% moisture. If you store at 28% moisture, there'll be mold within three days. So you have to dry it. Now, the question is, how much do I dry it? If you can dry it to, let's say, 20%, and you're storing at 85 degrees Fahrenheit, you got about a week before bad things will happen. Mm. You dry it down to 16%, you got a month. At 14%, you got a year. So that's pretty good. The two problems. Drying it down to 14% takes a lot of energy. Talk about carbon footprint and, and, and cost. Number two, what you thought was a thousand pounds now became 940 pounds because you dried it. Now, you don't want to dry too much because you're losing money, man, because Mm -hmm. you sell by the weight. So you have a dilemma. How much do I keep it moist? How much do I dry it? This is where this decision making comes in. So this is where we can help. Farmer can say, look, I want to maintain a 17% moisture, but anything if CO2 level goes up, tell me I'm going to dry down to 15%. We can help automate the mechanism to accomplish that. That's where AI comes in. That's where machine learning comes in. That's where patterns and behavior comes in. That's what we are good at. Okay, that makes a lot of sense. So how exactly do how exactly does this AI work? I mean, as somebody that has a programming background, I understand it as basically AIs are a super duper if statement where they look at something and if this is um, if this is the causality or if this is the um, what's happening, then this happens. So is it is it kind of is that kind of how the AI works or is it? I mean, obviously it's going to be much more advanced than that, but is that kind of the rough concept? Short answer is yes, but of course AI is a big catch-all phrase. There are a bunch of things underneath. So mm-hmm. imagine that you do want to know what is the moisture outside, what's the weather prediction, and if it's going to rain in the next eight hours, what's the moisture inside? Do I suck air in or do I stop the fans? So over the time you learned the behavior, last time you did this, did what was the spoilage condition of the grain? You begin to memorize those. Over a period of time, all that memory turns into algorithms. Let's take another example. You have three uh, vertical silos. One of them is faces a southern sun. Two of them are under an oak tree or close to an oak tree and have a shadow on them. One of them runs three degrees warmer than the other two. One of them has a water leakage from the roof to just the way the rain hits it. They're going to have different thermal profile, different behavior. Imagine if you can create a thermal profile of each storage bin in the world and apply that to as correction mechanism to your prediction. This wow, is that'd be fascinating. Moving. Exactly. So I'm saying the problems are quite fascinating and it's challenging and not easy. But that's the kind of challenge that we are trying to solve with Telesense. 
Well, I mean, if it was easy, everybody would do it. And I mean, you see something you're passionate about and something, a problem that needs to be solved and you're jumping on it. So that's awesome. Yeah, exactly right. So how do you think this might affect consumers? I mean, if if we're trying to monitor grain um, temperatures, the moisture level, all that stuff, how might this affect the consumer at the end of the day? Are they going to have um, cheaper produce now? Or, I mean, obviously they'll probably have more sustainable produce now, but what, how is that kind of going to affect consumers? So you ever wonder, I mean, ask your parents, when they're growing up, did anybody complain about food allergies and and mm. can't eat gluten-free and all that. Stuff. Those words were not even used when I was growing up. Why is that everybody has that problem? And if you look at it, there are multiple reasons. I don't claim to know all of them, but some of them are, you it's a lot of crud you're eating. Mm-hmm. So in you know, storing soybean, corn, you get some moisture, you get a like hot spot, you try to cool it down. There's a big clunk. Sometimes people have to, in the silos, break them with, picks and spears, but all that is blended together with good stuff and bad stuff so the overall specs are met. But all that junk is in our food supply chain. So my point is what we are proposing with better management of grain, you can reduce some of the spoilage, there'll be less crud, that directly impacts the end consumer. So there are other factors too, but what I'm describing is a factor and that should be handled and that's it is possible to handle that. So the end consumer will care. The second way they will care is if we are doing it right, then it should impact positively the profit margin and the grain quality. So if you're a tofu maker in Tokyo, you want a certain quality of soybeans coming in, avoiding certain things. And we are coming up with a way to monitor and give you a fine grain quality metric. It's something we plan to talk about next year. I don't wanna preempt myself, but there are some tricks under works which will give us that kind of a, a, a quality metric credibility in the stored grain. That's awesome. So going off of that a little bit, kind of the future, um, I mean, what markets have you been testing in or working in right now? I mean, I've seen that you've done some U.S. and European testing. Is that right? No, we're highly focused on U.S. and North America, 70% focus here, 20% in Australia. Australia is a huge agriculture economy and lots of grain and lots of issues. And then Europe is the third focus. But as we get more established and get you know more things going here, the next is Brazil and Argentina. And then we are focused on the Black Sea region. These are big producing, uh, grain producing places. And then will be the South Asian country. So the market is huge. It sounds like it. So, I mean, what's the, what's the feedback been like so far from farmers that maybe have used it for a little bit or tested it? Feedback is very positive. And, uh, you know, a lot of time when you go and explain what we do, people say, where have you been all my life? You know, <laughs> so it's not like people are saying, I don't believe you. I think the mostly the issue is they want to, you know, farmers are one of the most skeptical people you'll sell to. So they want to, we're selling to not just farmers, but co-ops and grain trading companies. So they want to try that in one location, one pile, two bins. And the, you got to go through the whole one year cycle when storage and selling, and then they, build their credibility and then they from there they want to go to multiple bins or multiple locations. So it is a slow ramp to business like that. But which is okay because you know we're building the railroad when the train is coming down. So we we are learning from what we are seeing and we're improving the products, making them more bulletproof. So these are all the thing which is natural evolution of any startup. Mm, that's a very good point. I like that. So what do you see as kind of the future of agriculture and food production? Do you see kind of more and more tech startups starting and solving problems that have been around for a while? Uh, I mean, I think ag is one of those industries where we really have every discipline. I mean, we have engineering, we have math, we have biology, we've got chemistry, meteorology, everything. And so do you think this trend of more and more startups is going to continue and solve more and more problems with technology? Absolutely. We're just getting started. Ag tech is certainly one of the hottest area in venture capital. I don't know how many, it was more than a billion, I think it was, I forget, $1.6 billion were invested in ag tech startups last year. So there's many trends because consumers are also revolting against packaged food. Mm. And you know, what, did you know that every apple you eat was harvested at least a year ago, if not more? I did not know that. Yeah. So I was surprised to find that out myself. (laughs) 
So just the way ecosystem, that's why you remember there's a waxy layer on the Apple. You wonder, what, what is this wax doing here? You have to wash it off. Mm-hmm. So the fact is that the trend now is a hyper local, locally grown without with fewer amount of pesticides and consumer are demanding it. So I see a future in agriculture when there'll be a lot more uh, grown locally, shipped locally. So you're reducing the transport. And uh, if it's locally, it doesn't have to wait six weeks or eight weeks before it's eaten. You don't need as many spray it with a bunch of chemicals because you're going to eat it within two days or a week. So this is the trend. And if anything, the pandemic has taught us that we don't have to live in a crowded city to make a good living and be productive. You could be productive remotely with all the tools we have now. So I see a trend, this is a long-term trend, of de-urbanization, local communities, locally grown food, and all that will be enabled through some advanced technology. So I see a bright future ahead, unlike most people. Mm. Yeah, th- that's a good point. I've seen, I'm sure you've seen them too, a lot of um, hydroponic companies like a Gotham Greens from New York, or I think they have a new place in San Francisco where they're growing um, lettuce and other greeny vegetables in yeah. old abandoned warehouses. And I mean, they're using urban areas to grow produce and that's saving so much money. It's reducing carbon footprints and stuff like that. And so, I mean, that's a really good point. And I've always thought the the farther the consumer is from the farmer on the food supply chain, the unhealthier that food is going to be. It's going to be super processed, um, bloated with sugar and other not so healthy things. And so if we can grow food more locally, whether you're in a city or in a, um, a rural town, the, the closer you can be to that food, the fresher it's going to be and the healthier you're, you're going to be. And I mean, I know here in the U.S. and I mean, I think so in other countries around the world, I mean, We've got a health issue where people just aren't eating healthy. And so hopefully all this new ag tech companies can kind of help solve that kind of with sustainability, with diets and all that good stuff. No, I think you're right on. This is what's, you know, you're not, this is back to the future. Yeah, yeah that's true. Been like this for 5,000 years. And thank you very much. Mm-hmm. That system had worked. We know it works. So now oh, yeah. back to the future. That's a good movie or a good couple of movies. Um, yeah. So I just thought of something and I want to get your viewpoints on it. Um, have you heard anything in Silicon Valley about 3D printed food? I know things like lab grown meat and stuff like that are starting to get more and more popular, but I'm always fascinated with how um, 3D printed food might be a thing in the future where, I don't know, like in a hundred years, if you want a steak for dinner or I don't know, um, a burger, you can just go to a 3D printer and print it. So have you heard anything kind of in those developments? So uh, short answer is no. Long answer mm-hmm. is I'm a big fan of 3D printing. It's going gonna, it's gonna to play a huge role in supply chain and hyper-local delivery. And so anywhere from organ being printed in a, in a, in a operating room, you know, you cut somebody open, you see, I guess the kidney has to be replaced too, so you print them. Mm-hmm. And already there's, there's a lot of research, and I can talk more about that. Two, already what's happening is books. So there's no reason to ship a bunch of books from New York to San Francisco you, and you can ship electronic file and print them in the warehouse. And so that's already happening. It's already happening to a bunch of other uh, uh, auto parts and airline parts uh, with metal 3D printing. Food, I'm skeptical. I don't know. Is it theoretically possible? I'm going to argue yes, <laughs> but I'm not excited about this. This sounds pretty weird, but you know, I don't know if I want to eat a 3D printed burger. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. Yeah. I don't know how that would taste. I mean, I've seen stuff years ago um, at CES, the Consumer Electronic um, Showcase. They had a chocolate candy one. And I mean, that was pretty simple. They just printed out milk chocolate in like 3D forms yeah. and stuff like that. So that was really cool. But yeah, I mean, I'm imagining like if you can 3D print a burger or something in 100 years, you're going to have something like a huge printer with a bunch of cartridges in the back for something for the meat, for the bread, for the sauce, the lettuce, the cheese, the whatever. So I don't know. It's always curious. I wonder how that's going to be. I mean, I think real food, real meat is always going to be a thing, but it's very curious to see kind of where the future takes us. Yeah, I think this the question is, what problem are we solving with 3D printing the burger? <laughs> <laughs> yeah, that's true. I mean, I'm sure it would be super duper expensive and probably not taste nearly as good for a long yeah. while. Exactly. <laughs> 
Well, Naeem, this has been super cool, man, chatting with you about Silicon Valley and Telesense. Um, if people want to learn more about Telesense and the company, where can they go to kind of see what's going on? Well, uh, easy, telesense.com. The website should have some information and, and other data for you. We're ready to engage, learn from the people. And we're just starting with grain. But fact is the technology fundamentally is applicable to other perishable, like potatoes is next. We're looking at potatoes now. But peanuts, coffee, there are all kinds of things where there's a potential perishability and spoilage. And data-based approach, sensor-based approach could be helpful. So we'd love to talk to you and learn more about the commodity you're involved with. Yeah, exactly. And and I just thought about something. Um, You brought it up with potatoes. I've heard a lot of potato and even onion farmers um, due to COVID, they've been just burying their, their crops because there's no demand for them. And so do you think something like Telesense can help them store their crops longer in these bunkers or in grain bins whenever we might have pandemics like we do right now with COVID? Yeah, yeah short answer is yes. Uh, the long answer is uh, there's something else going on which is more relevant. So one of the problems with potatoes is uh, ant is sprouting. You, mm -hmm. You've seen potato you buy from supermarket, like a couple of weeks later, it's sprouting. You don't want to feel like eating it. So sprouting is an issue. There was a chemical, I think called CICL, which was banned in Europe recently. So they cannot use that to suppress sprouting. So they need what we make even more so now. In the US, it's not banned yet. So people still can spray the chemical and stop sprouting. But in some other countries, when the CICL is being banned, this is a huge opportunity for us. And it just changed like last year. So oh, wow. there's, a, there's, a, there's a reason to jump on that one. Yeah, that makes sense. Yeah, I've got a few potatoes in our in our kitchen right now that are sprouting. So I know <laughs> that struggle. Yeah. But um, we've got a little backyard garden. So anytime they sprout too much, I just cut them up in little cubes and plant them. And uh, yeah. usually nine times out of 10, we get some more potatoes. So we'll see. Nice. nice. I did not know that. I should try that myself. <laughs> Yeah, yeah, it works pretty well. So when I taught, uh, we had a big hydroponic system and we grew lettuce, um, peppers and stuff and strawberries. And I try. I was curious. I was like, you know what? Can we grow potatoes in a hydroponic system? And so we had some old potatoes sprouting. And so I cut them up, put them in there. And it was kind of this ebb and flow system where you'd have the plants in these pots, these net pots. I had a bunch of holes in them and you'd put the plants around these little clay pellets which basically the water could go in between the clay pellets for about 30 minutes and it would drain out so the roots could get air. And so I put some um, potatoes in those clay pots to kind of see what would go on. Well, about a week went by and nothing happened. And I was like, well, we're like, what's going on? Why is nothing sprouting? Uh, come to find out that they just dissolved because they were in the water too much. So, I see, I see. Um, which, I mean, it makes a lot of sense in hindsight, but I was like, you know what? Might as well try it. But mm -hmm. it was one of those good failures like we were talking about earlier where, you, you know, you learn something funny. That's right. <laughs> All right. Well, Neem, is there anything else you want to touch base on before we wrap up? No, I think it's been a fun conversation. Uh, it's, uh, I'm, I'm glad to talk to you and share some of the vision we have for the world of the future in ag tech. And I'm uh, hoping to talk again when we have even made more progress and have more stories to share with you. Yeah, absolutely. Yeah, we'll have to fo uh, follow through and touch base with you guys um, later on and see how Telesense is doing. But yeah, this has been a super cool conversation. I'm glad we got a chance to sit down virtually. Um, Best of luck with Telesense, and can't wait to see what you guys are doing in about a year or so. Thank you, Trevor. Looking forward to it. Thank you.